These ruins are in Upington, a South African city in close proximity to the front lines with the Boer. Now for weeks, German bombers from the airfields of Sudwest Africa, as the Reich Commissariat was called, conducted terror bombing campaigns all over towns and cities in their range. Although larger population centers, like East London and Cape Town, are safe under the vanguard of the South African Air Force. The ruins around me tell a less fortunate story. Once a busy marketplace, tragedy stuck when German bombs fell into the crowds of hundreds, or a few dozen according to South African officials. When we inquired why we saw at least a dozen more bodies than the official tally says, the response we've got was that black bodies were not counted. For the past few weeks, the Africa Child has launched a massive assault across the front lines, from Namamkwaland to here, Uppington. To some, including the officials we've met, these ruins mean little more than futile attempts to terrorize a resilient population into submission. But others have put the South African war effort into question. Since the start of the war more than a year ago, the South African Defense Force has not made a single advance into Shild territory. The Skyld, comprised of covetous mercenaries, disillusioned SS troops, and demotivated African natives, even without the supply and support of their home country, which now embroils in a heated civil war, have managed to maintain a consistent war effort and made continuous breakthroughs in the front lines. So what is the reason behind the Skyld's successes? To answer these questions, we looked at all the sides involved in this war. The South Africans, the Boers, and the Germans. Who, what, when, where, why? Brought to you by the Iberian National Tourism Board. Tonight, report from South Africa. Brought to you by Walter Cronkite. There are three sides in South Africa. The Boers, descendants of earlier Dutch colonists, have settled here for centuries. Disgruntled at the British rule, the Boers hopes to establish a free Boer republic aligned with the Einheitspakt. The South Africans, at least those who regard themselves such, are mostly descendants of British colonists, though many with Dutch ancestry, including the leader of the United Party, de Villiers Graf. The Boers are mere puppets of the Germans. They seek to extend their clause of tyranny and exploitation to the last bastion of democracy in Africa. We must resist at all costs. Most South Africans stand behind the United Party, the ruling party of South Africa. Albeit it's claimed to stand behind all South Africans, the interest of Boers and the native Africans have always been secondary. Finally, there are the native Africans. Their interests regarded the lowest among the three parties. They stand behind the African National Congress, the party that aims to end any sort of discriminatory policies in South Africa. Behind me is Cape Town, where everything begun. Just more than a year ago, a few blocks from where I stand to the Parliament building, a group of ANC protesters were brutally gunned down by police forces. The massacre sent a shock throughout the nation and forever tarnished the image of South African unity the United Party so desperately wanted to build. This event came to be known as the Cape Town Massacre. During this hotbed of ethnic tensions, the Boers, seizing the advantage of a nationwide turmoil, took the opportunity to succeed from the South Africa Union and drove the militaries out of Transvaal and the Orange Free State. The Boers were led by Albert Herzog, leader of the National Party. As a fanatical Calvinist, he supports everything that will preserve the racial and religious purity of the Afrikaners and ensure their continued dominance over all other groups, black or white. When the opportunity came, Herzog took the initiative to succeed from South Africa. However, the Boer militants stood no chance against the much formidable armies of South Africa. The real propagators, as we know, is the Africa Child. The Africa Child is an alliance between the German Reichskommissariats of Sudwest Africa, Ostafrika, and Central Africa, formed shortly after the death of Adolf Hitler and the outbreak of the German Civil War. 
We begin with the Reichskommissariat of Central Africa, led by Siegfried Müller. Central Africa is commonly referred as the heart of Africa, controlling the Great Congo Basin and the sprawling plantations surrounding it, and with extensive foreign investment. Central Africa controls the vast wealth of German Africa. German ships fill the various rivers and canals, taking these riches across the continent and to the heart of the Reich itself. Shortly after Germany took the colony from Belgium, German engineers have managed to dam the Congo River, creating a huge lake in the center, becoming a popular resort destination for all members of the Einheitspakt. Unlike other Nazi officials, Siegfried Muller is a personality. He even appeared on an interview with Mike Wallace. In the interview, Muller explains how he views Central Africa as an opportunity for all men of fortune and how he enjoys going on safari and hunting, then to spend his time doing administrative work. It is indeed true that, compared to the other Reichskommissariats, Central Africa does not enforce any of the Reich's typical racial policies. The administration is comprised of English mercenaries and local chieftains, while the garrison is fielded by free French soldiers, Belgium colonists, and even black African SS. To Müller, the war is one of fortune. Once the rich wilderness of South Africa is conquered, he will no doubt be the first to safari there. As we return to Upington, the site of the bombings, we trace the bombs back to its perpetrator, Wolfgang Schenk. Reichskommissar of Sudwest Africa. Unlike Central Africa, the lands of Sudwest Africa or Southwest Africa is filled with poverty, disease, and rebels. Its lands are barren. The great Namibian desert spans for thousands of kilometers. Yet the Germans are resourceful. The deserts host the largest and most developed airfields on the entire continent. For years, German Luftwaffe regularly launched missions across Western Africa, indiscriminately bombing both civilian and military targets. The Luftwaffe terror bombing has crippled West African growth for decades. Now, the bombers direct their bombs to the towns and cities of South Africa, but to West Africa, they are finally offered a chance to breathe. Who, what, when, where, why? Brought to you by the Iberian National Tourism Board. Welcome to Iberia, the land where history, culture, and natural beauty come together to create an unforgettable experience. Discover the stunning natural beauty of Iberia, like the majestic peaks and valleys of the Picos de Europa National Park. Explore the enchanting palaces and fortresses of Iberia, like the Alcazar of Seville, a magnificent example of Mudejar architecture. Experience the charm and romance of Iberia's small towns and villages, like the picturesque village of Sintra, surrounded by lush forests and gardens. So why not make Iberia your next destination? Book your trip today and discover the magic of this unique and unforgettable land. Iberia awaits you. Tonight, report from South Africa. Brought to you by Walter Cronkite. Now let's talk about the elephant in the room. Reichskommissariat Ostafrika. Not much is said about Ostafrika. Not much is heard of Ostafrika. But there's certainly rumors. Stories told by Africans and former British colonists who managed to escape what they call as hell. If the administration of Central Africa can be said as unorthodox, then Ost Africa is ruled more like Germany than Germany itself. Hans Huttig, originally a commandant of an SS concentration camp, actively enforces Germanian racial policies, to some extent the strictest of all Reichskommissariats. People of Ost Africa live in harsh labor camps with no way of achieving freedom. The Reichskommissariat is in a constant state of war as local resistance offer a small yet persistent guerrilla campaign. Ost Africa does not employ native SS soldiers and has maintained a small yet well-trained force. It is effectively the strongest of the three Reichskommissariats. 
Should Hudig extend his control to South Africa, we could not imagine the African devastation to come. But not all hope is lost for South Africa. In the next episode, we will interview General William Westmoreland, Command-in-Chief of OFN Coalition Forces in South Africa.